Uh, well, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Devolution for Their Powers Committee. Um, as usual, can I just ask everyone to check that their mobile phones are at least on silent and won't interfere with proceedings, exactly what I'm doing now, just to check. Um, we do have apologies, which we'll receive from Tavish Scott, MSP. Um, I think that Bill Kidd, MSP, will join us at some stage. Um, I think he's going to be the substitute for Stuart Maxwell, MSP. Uh, no other apologies have been received at the time uh, at this stage. Um, agenda item one um, is seeking agreement of members that agenda items six and seven <coughs> be taken in private. Uh, have we agreed? agreed? Thank you very much. That takes us to agenda item two, uh, subordinate legislation, um, in particular this, the Scotland Act 1998 modification of schedules four and five and transfer of the functions to the Scottish Ministers, etc., Order 2015. Um, and we have witnesses here this morning. I, I welcome you, um, Cabinet Secretary and Deputy First Minister John Swinney, um, Stephen Sadler, uh, Team Leader from the Elections and Constitution Division, and Neil Moji, if I've got that right, uh, Policy Advisor on Elections and Constitution Division, also in the Scottish Government. And Deputy First Minister, can I thank you in particular for being able to come to the this particular meeting at such extremely short notice that was given to you. We're very grateful you were able to attend in the circumstances. I, I suspect you'll wish to make an opening statement. Uh, yeah, if I could convey, um, I welcome the committee's invitation to attend today and to present the draft order. Um, we're considering the Scotland Act 1998 modification of schedules four and five and transfer of functions to the Scottish Ministers, etc. Order 2015 that will transfer competence to the Scottish Parliament to extend the franchise to 16- and 17-year-olds in Scottish Parliament and local government elections. The terms of the order the Committee is considering this morning have been agreed by the Scottish and United Kingdom governments to give effect to the recommendation at paragraph 25 of the report of the Smith Commission that called on the UK Parliament to, and I quote, devolve the relevant powers in sufficient time to allow the Scottish Parliament to extend the franchise to 16- and 17-year-olds for the 2016 Scottish parliamentary elections. The powers to be devolved through the Section 30 order, subject to agreement in this Parliament and at Westminster, are narrowly focused on enfranchising 16- and 17-year-olds. Full powers over Scottish Parliament and local government elections will follow later through the proposed Scotland Bill. The Scottish Government is satisfied that the order in front of the Committee will enable the Scottish Government to bring forward legislation to lower the voting age for future elections to the Scottish Parliament and local government elections in Scotland. The order also transfers the power to legislate to make provision about registration in order to give effect to any reduction in the minimum voting age. This will allow us to build on one of the key democratic triumphs of the referendum campaign. As I indicated in the Chamber on Tuesday, those of us who witnessed the engagement and enthusiasm of young people in exercising their democratic rights saw the value and the impact of this participation on the process. Since the referendum, I have been delighted to see there is now unanimous support across the Parliament for lowering the voting age to 16, and I hope that support will be demonstrated by agreement to the Section 30 order in time for it to be considered by the Privy Council on the 19th of March. At the start of this week, the House of Lords Select Committee on the Constitution published a report on the order. Uh, prompted by your question, convener, on the report on Tuesday, Parliament was given the opportunity to make its views knowns, uh, known on the points raised by the Lords Committee. The views expressed on Tuesday were clear and unambiguous. The decision on whether and if so how to lower the voting age is one for the Scottish Parliament to take. Uh, subject to parliamentary approval of this order, the Scottish Government will bring forward legislation shortly, setting out detailed proposals to achieve this aim. The parliamentary stages of this legislation will provide the usual opportunity for Parliament to consider the details, to seek public views and to debate our proposals. And I look forward to discussing these issues with the Committee this morning. I thank you, Deputy First Minister. This is now the chance for the Committee to ask any questions, make any comments, and of course at this stage, it's free for the Deputy First Minister to also involve officials if they wish to be so. So has anyone got any points, any questions they would like to make? Rob? There seems to be an apparent lack of clarity in Article 5 with regard to the extent of the functions to be exercisable by the Scottish Ministers concurrently with the Secretary of State. Do you have uh, uh, any views on that, uh, Deputy the, the, First Minister? The, the issues in, uh, in, in 
section five, I, I've seen the report of the um, a, what used to be the subordinate legislation committee. One day I'll remember what it's actually called. Uh, <laughs> um, the the uh, and essentially the the. The, the, the powers under Section 5 uh, are trying to deal with what is um, in, certainly not an issue from our perspective, uh, an understanding that has to be put into the order that there will be certain powers around registration which will continue to be exercised by United Kingdom government ministers, particularly in relation to um, individual, uh, individual electoral registration. Um, and Section 5 essentially recognises that what, how we act on this question has to be compatible with what steps have been taken by UK ministers, with which we have, we have no issue and we quite understand why that's a requirement. And um, it is essentially focused on um, the uh, activities that will be taken forward principally around individual electoral registration and the digital implications of all of that. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, the House of Lords um, Select Committee on the Constitution also published its report uh, on this, and they suggested that, well, they actually highlighted their concerns uh, that, uh, uh, that the extension of the franchise will, uh, in, uh, for Scotland goes beyond the Smith Commission recommendations, uh, as, uh, and also that they highlighted that there's not been a, a, a wide consultation. Uh, in, the, in this aspect regarding the order. Do you have any concerns about that? I, I, I don't have concerns about that. I, I think the, um, the, the point on translating the Smith Commission recommendations into, uh, into practice, and if I go back to um, the point that um, a Mr. Uh, the, the Smith Commission settled on was devolving the relevant powers in sufficient time to allow the Scottish Parliament to extend the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds for the 2016 Parliament, the Scottish parliamentary elections um, it is you know, very clearly reflected in what the order is taking forward. The additional element is around uh, the uh, devolution of responsibility around local authority elections, which the Smith Commission provides for in other respects within its uh, wider responsibilities, uh, where full powers over Scottish parliamentary and local authority elections will follow um, in due course. I think the the, 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 the only point I think that um, the House of Lords Committee makes of any substance here is the issue of, um, of consultation. And of course that issue will be remedied by the legislation that we take forward. It's not as if this is the last word on the matter. There is a bill that's got to come through the Scottish Parliament. It will have to be undertaken through, have to go through the usual um, channels of analysis and scrutiny that any bill in this parliament has to go through and that will open up the opportunity for uh, a whole range of stakeholders to make their contribution. I think the key point here is that there's a, 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 a practical democratic point at the heart of all of this that um, it is clear that the intention of this parliament is to ensure that 16 and 17 year olds can participate in the elections for which we have responsibility. And we have form on that, we've legislated for that on previous occasions, we legislated for it on the independence re referendum, we legislated for it on the pilot exercises around, local authority, uh, around um, health board elections. Uh, so that the, what the order does, and this is where I, I am very happy with the, 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 the point we've reached with the UK government, is that we're able to take forward that in practical form to reflect the democratic intentions of this parliament. Thank you. Louise MacDonald. Thanks very much, Cabinet Secretary. The, her purpose and intent are clear and, and, and I think, as, as, as you say, are uh, broadly supported. One, one of the points made by the Constitution Committee of the Lords was to draw uh, or to highlight what they regarded as a difference between provision in the draft clauses for future amendment of the franchise and provision within uh, the order. Is that something you recognise? And if so, what would your comments be? I think th those issues, again, are, will be covered by the, 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 the bill process that the Scottish Parliament will go through. And I think the, I th I think the point where I, 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 the point I thought that the Lords Committee um, missed completely was the fact that there was to be a process of legislation undertaken by the Scottish 
Parliament that would explore all of these questions with the usual rigour that is taken forward. So I, I think the um, I, I think that's the that would be my answer to the point that Mr. Macdonald raises. I think the all of these issues are properly captured by the bill process that we will undertake. Would it be fair to deduce that the clearly uh, constructive engagement you've had with the UK government on this means that the bill, as it, when it is finally coming forward, will reflect the intention behind the draft clauses that the UK government has published? Certainly, the, well, well, the, the focus of the draft clauses is to extend the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds in Scottish parliamentary and local authority elections. That will be the purpose of the legislation the Scottish government brings forward. Fabiani. Uh, thank you. One of the concerns that, that was quite apparent in the House of Lords report <coughs> excuse me, um, was about data protection issues for young people, um, protection of vulnerable people. We, we extensively covered that in the Referendum Bill Committee um, because there was great concerns by all the members of that that we would protect people. And uh, I, I just wondered about your view as to whether the extensive work we did in that committee was taken into account um, you know, by the House of Lords and have you and your team had any concerns at all about how that was dealt with through the referendum process? I think the example of how this issue was first highlighted by stakeholders, <coughs> then exhaustively considered by the committee uh, within the Scottish Parliament, which influenced the legislation that the government brought forward in connection with the legislation and the fact that you know, I certainly have not had any representations of concern about the way in which this issue was handled in the independence referendum. And, uh, and I think the issues are very, very important. It is vital that those issues around data protection, around privacy, about the protection of vulnerable individuals are all absolutely comprehensively taken forward by Parliament. The fact that we don't have any concerns Express, or certainly no concerns have been expressed to me as part of uh, the, the aftermath of the referendum, I think is a tribute to the strength of the scrutiny that was undertaken by committees in advance of the referendum. And I think the, 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 there will clearly be lessons to be learnt from that process. There will be strong foundations upon which our position should be based um, in taking forward this legislation. But we shouldn't just take the view that because we got it right in the run-up to the referendum, we'll automatically get it right in the run-up to the Scottish parliamentary elections. So we should test these issues with just as much rigour, and I would encourage the committee to do so, to make sure that we absolutely, because you know, the government's interest will be the same as Parliament's interest, to make sure that there is no breach of privacy, that the interests of vulnerable individuals are properly taken into account, and that will be reflected in how the uh, the, the government interacts with the committee on that question and I certainly would invite the committee to be very um, a clear in its challenge to government around how we take forward that legislation. Uh, perhaps next time you're down there you can invite the House of Lords to have a look as well. It would, <laughs> it, certainly, I, I, think they, you know, I, think, I think there was one of the points, one of my observations about the House of Lords report was that I didn't, um, I didn't feel the concerns or the issues that have been raised about process in, in, that had taken place or anything that was relevant from that really took into account what had been a very robust process that was undertaken by the committees of this parliament and the parliament and by the Scottish Government. If there are no other questions, I would just like to ask one particular question because obviously if incredibly the House of Lords were, was not to pass the order today, because um, the order is going in front of them today, what do you think the impact would be on the ability of 16 and 17 year olds to be able to achieve the vote and get their legislation through in time? I think if, it, if the order is not passed today, I, I'm not sufficiently um, familiar with the timetabling and circumstances of the interaction between the House of Lords decision and the Privy Council. But if this order is not passed, satisfactorily and it reaches the Privy Council on the night if it doesn't reach the Privy Council on the 19th of March then there will be no section 30 order before the United Kingdom election and then I think in that context the ability of the Scottish Parliament to have adequate time to legislate 
were a Section 30 order to be passed at a later stage, or if um, the, we were to rest on the Scotland Bill taking its course, uh, then I cannot see how it would be practically possible for 16 and 17-year-olds to exercise the vote in the 2016 election. So the crucial date is can the Privy Council meeting on the 19th of March be reached? That is fundamental to enabling this legis the Scottish Parliament to then be able to commence its legislative process. Yeah, the Privy Council, I understand, meets on the 19th of March, so timescales are very tight. And, uh, and we'll have to, as a Parliament, consider the order next week in order to meet that deadline for the Privy Council. So I think that makes it pretty clear about this sort of... But it's, it's certainly, the, if, you know, my, my, my view is that if this, if this order is not approved by the Privy Council on the 19th of March, then I cannot see how 16 and 17-year-olds will be able to vote in the Scottish parliamentary elections in 2016, because um, the order will not have been approved, so we then can't start our legislative process here. And then if we were to wait till after the UK election, if we waited for another Section 30 order, that would take time. And then I think our window to successfully legislate and then undertake the process of registration would be severely curtailed. And if, if I actually think it would be in practice, utterly impractical, actually, and if we waited for a bill, it's completely impractical. Okay. Is there any other questions? If there are no other questions, I, I thank you, um, Deputy First Minister, for that particular part of it. In the name of the Committee's Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, which, uh, which the, the clerk had to give me a note about because I can never remember either. Um, we now move on to Agenda Item 3. Uh, and at this stage, can I ask the Deputy First Minister to move the motion that the Devolution Further Powers Committee recommend that the Scotland Act 1998 modification of schedules four and five, transfer of functions to Scottish ministers, order, etc., be approved. It moved, Kavir. Um, I ask the members if they agree the motion. Yeah. Okay, for the, for the purpose of the record, can we record that the motion was agreed unanimously? And I thank the Deputy First Minister for his attendance this morning. And we'll just have a few moments now. Um, we'll just go into, into private for a few moments to allow the witnesses to change over. Thank you very much.
Um, we recommence with item four on the agenda today, uh, uh, evidence from three experts on borrowing powers. Um, our experts today, and I welcome you, are Professor David Bell, Professor of Economics at University of Stirling, Don Peebles, the head of SIPFA in Scotland, and Philip Milburn, the investment manager, Keynes Capital and Investment Association. Now, to try to, to get through this in a structured way, and we're timing this for about half past ten, I think we should maybe look at this in three ways. Um, the principles that will underpin the framework to enable borrowing by a sub-national government, any specific challenges around that, um, further powers and revenue borrowing and capital borrowing and what the mix is and what would the right appropriate mix would be, and the overall fiscal framework and, what, and the institutional bits that will underpin it all. Uh, if we try to concentrate in these three areas, I think we can probably get through what we need, need to be able to do. Um, I'll just ask my colleagues, gentlemen, to ask you questions as we go along. They may ask you of an individual, uh, but on, on most occasions it will probably be to everyone on the panel. So I'm very grateful for you coming along today to give us evidence in helping us come to our conclusions. Now, can I just begin by a very general question? The UK command paper containing the draft clauses are relatively, relevant, are, are relatively silent on borrowing powers to be devolved, instead indicating that's a matter for agreement between the UK and Scottish governments. And therefore, do you consider that legislation should be required in this order to devolve powers in this area? And in any case, uh, what principles or structures should underpin the devolution of borrowing powers? And I guess to all three of you, please, I don't mind, I don't mind who kicks off. I'll pick that up uh, initially, right, convener. Um, the, uh, the introduction of the Prudential Code and local authorities, um, I think, is probably a useful um, comparator. Uh, if we go back to 2000 and, uh, the 2003 legislation, um, there was a requirement for a change to primary legislation to enable the, the significant change, which it was at that time, uh, for the introduction of a more flexible framework. Our expectation was that there would be some indicator and some indication that there would um, almost certainly be um, some forward notification of change. You're right um, to actually observe that the, the clauses are, are silent on borrowing powers. Um, and that was one of the points that we actually made in our, our written submission, that uh, for as much as we're actually here to talk about borrowing powers, and there's been much discussion on borrowing powers since the, uh, the publication of the, the Smith uh, Commission, um, there has been nothing firm and fast that uh, would indicate that there is a certainty that um, enhanced borrowing powers will be, will be introduced. I see no borrowing powers in the, uh, the, the command paper. Uh, there are no clauses that would indicate um, anything which would um, even um, determine that, that there is a forward requirement for um, enhanced borrowing powers in, in any way. Um, that said, um, our expectation about um, uh, change the primary legislation, if that's going to come uh, at a further point, um, then what is that actually going to look like is probably what we're going to go on to, uh, to debate. And the, the change in primary legislation for local authorities um, all those years ago was to actually remove it from a largely um, prescriptive framework um, where local authorities um, were, um, in fact, um, advised how much they could borrow for uh, capital expenditure to a framework which was significantly more flexible, allowing individual local authorities to determine themselves what was affordable and what was sustainable. Um, and that has been the general debate so far, the expectation that that, uh, that kind of framework would be overlaid over Scotland. Uh, but we're, uh, we're silent on, on fact so far, and we're certainly silent on, on clause. Um, so I think that the useful comparison um, is with local authorities where, and this is my evidence to the committee, primary legislation change was actually needed. David? Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, there is quite a bit of discussion of the Prudential Code in the, um, uh, in the uh, draft paper. There is, um, of course, the borrowing powers that are coming to Scotland in relation to the Scotland Act 2012. I guess there's a, a, a real question, we maybe come back to that, about whether they will be sufficient given the enhanced tax powers, and I, I suspect they wouldn't be uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, <clears throat> in one sense, it might be a little bit different from the, the local authority issue, um, though, in that Scotland, well, it's, it's pretty, it's relatively large compared with 
the average local authority in, in England. So um, there isn't uh, necessarily a, a worry to the same extent that borrowing uh, at um, a local authority level would overall threaten the, uh, the UK's fiscal position. Uh, probably Scotland is, is still relatively small and that, and, and that wouldn't be the case. I think local authority borrowing uh, at the moment is around 83 billion in, I think that's England and Wales, uh, that's set against overall central government, central government borrowing of 1.2 trillion. You know, so it's it's relatively small, uh, it, small beer at, at the moment. Um, it is important also to think about the capital uh, borrowing on the one hand and the resource borrowing, and I, th I guess we'll, we'll we'll deal with that. But it seems to me that where we are is that um, the uh, draft paper has some discussion, but there's nowhere near enough for us to be going on, you know, and, and saying this is, this is how it's going to be. There's a lot up for debate, it seems to me. There's a lot of work still to be done before we come up with, with um, uh, a set of figures uh, that could be agreed on. And, and one of the issues I think probably will be uh, around bailout, and I mentioned that in my in my, in my paper, uh, and argue that actually um, difficulties between central and subnational governments are relatively common. So, I guess what the Treasury will uh, try to be doing will be to avoid difficulties uh, in which it might appear that. Um, the uh, UK government would bail out the Scottish government if it, if, it, if it got into difficulty. If the markets believe that that's the case, then Scotland would be able to borrow at a slightly lower rate if, if there's a belief that there's a backstop there uh, uh, eventually. So I, whether that needs primary legislation or not, I don't think I'm qualified to say, but there will be, a lot, I think, a lot of debate around that issue. I don't know if you want to contribute this. Just a very, <clears throat> very small amount to add, and thank you for all for your time this morning. I completely agree with uh, Professor David there, in that I see my role here is almost to say what the markets would want. The markets will always want as much certainty as possible. So the stronger the framework, the stronger the legislation, the more markets will understand, the more markets will therefore charge less of a risk premium. Um, so basically, the stronger legislation is what the markets generically, not me specifically, but the markets generically would look for. Okay, this is probably a good a place to start anyway in terms of the institutional framework. Um, so I'll just begin a, a discussion with that. And if anybody wants to come in, please show me that you, you want to. Um, so it would be good to hear from you and what advice you can give us um, that would uh, enable us to uh, advise the Treasury or any, in U any incoming UK government of what that institutional framework might look like and how it would operate because that's actually going to be the thing that's really going to underpin um, the, whether or not we get the credit ratings from Moody's and Standard & Poor's that we require and at the level we require. So if you've got any advice on that, I think probably now's the time to let us know. It might be it's a big question, I know, but... I, I mean, just, just one issue. I, I suppose there's an institutional argument about should there be uh, uh, some uh, third party that's that's holding the ring around this this particular uh, question so it, it's not all driven from the treasury um, because you know th the issue will probably also arise in relation to wales it may well also arise in relation to northern ireland and for all we know given yesterday's developments in relation to some of the larger um, uh, local authorities in England, uh, you know, with Manchester getting uh, control over NHS spending. So uh, it seems to me that the, um, the, uh, the whole framework is moving around in, in, at the moment and nobody's really quite sure 
where it will end, will, it will settle. But, but I think there, there is a reasonable question to ask as to whether there should be some kind of external body that's looking at, at, at borrowing that has the confidence of the markets um, and that can uh, uh, exert some kind of, uh, um, or give them some, some, some of the sort of certainty that Philip was talking about. Philip, do you want to? Um, yep. to guess, um, unfortunately, my answer probably raises more questions than answers, and I apologize for that in advance. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's a typical financial practitioner there. Um, there's quite a few questions that would need answering. One of the most important ones is, what will service the debt? Um, will it be the Scottish tax revenue or the Scottish tax revenue plus the re remaining transfers from Westminster? Obviously, there's still going to be a mix because of who collects. Um, so there's, first of all, what services the debt? The assumption is generally that it would be all of the tax raising power. There's a next uh, question of where will the interest payments rank? Normally, um, obviously, interest payments rank about equivalent to all other spending. Uh, but if you take, for example, the Californian example, admittedly, California was in a fiscal mess. This is why it was set up like this. The interest payments are senior to many things such as teachers' wages, pensions, etc., which is politically close to unpalatable in most countries nowadays. But again, it's the certainty. All the markets want to do is, if they lend money, have that interest paid and get their money back. Um, so th there are institutional almost questions around that. The other thing I thought was quite interesting is, um, and Don referred to this, of, there's not a lot of explicit language in the command paper, but nearly all the numbers we've seen are absolute numbers of potential debt raised, be it the 2.2 or 5 billion that Don has modelled in his entries. We think, or I think, um, that an ad valorem limit, so a percent of GDP or something like that, would, uh, sorry, it's a dreadful English, but future-proof the system more um, so that you don't have to go back and renegotiate any um, legislation every 5, 10, 15 years and get into the same problems the US does with its debt ceiling or anything like that. So an ad valorem limit, I always think, would be preferable to an absolute limit. That's very helpful to you, Don. Worth um, putting all of this into to, to context, um, we, we've maybe let um, headlong into, into detail on that, and that's maybe us as practitioners, that's maybe what we, we actually love to, to do. David was right to actually draw attention to the, the, the staggering um, size of the, the outstanding debt of 1.3 trillion, which is for the, the UK. Um, and we started off speaking about uh, local authorities. £15 billion is uh, the, the outstanding uh, level of debt. Up at, around about £12 billion of the 15 is local authority debt in, in Scotland. So I think it's important to actually keep this, keep this uh, uh, sense of scale around that. Also, I think it's important to, to remember that uh, while there is risk with, uh, with debt and with borrowing, Borrowing is not a bad thing. It can be something which is quite significant and important for, for governments to actually take forward um, and to uh, implement policies in, in a short to medium term uh, basis, albeit there is there's a long term consequence um, associated with, with that. Um, so in, in managing that risk, I mean, it's right that there is some formal um, framework um, which is going to be a combination of primary legislation, regulation and, and professional practice as well, which we can see in other parts of the, the, the public sector. Um, in operating that, um, the point of all of that is to enable government, whether local or national, uh, to, to degenerate the money necessary to, to implement the policies. Importantly, equally, is that the borrowing in itself won't give anybody any more money, not one penny more money. All we're actually doing is rescheduling tax receipts, so it's a timing issue, in which case the, the key concern uh, is one of uh, intergenerational considerations, uh, the extent to which uh, one generation is benefiting, but further generations may have to actually foot the, the bill for, for that. But, but maintain that in context. David, do you want to say something else or not? Well, if, if I can quickly just say a couple of things. I, I mean, one reason why the Treasury is clearly very interested in this issue is that for I, my understanding is that for international agreements about, around debt, it's all of the, the, uh, the public sector debt that matters as far as the UK is concerned. It's not just central government debt. It's all other government debt, which includes local government debt and would include Scottish debt. So, so that's, you know, the Maastricht Agreement, for example, is one where limit a set of 60% of GDP, public sector debt. Well, that would include 
the kind of debt that uh, that we're, we're we're talking about now, and 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 Philip's point about sort of the pecking order of interest charges, I think is is pretty important. We're already spending, I think, it's close to a billion out of Dell on PFI uh, repayments. We've got an interesting situation where. Um, around 2.6 billion of welfare spending might come to Scotland. And you think, well, some of that, you could make a case for some of that going into Dell. But then it's, even welfare spending is coming up against um, uh, the possibility of where it lies in the pecking order if, there, if there's an issue around uh, interest charges and if interest charges have to be the first uh, a commitment uh, uh, that is met. So uh, there, there really is a, a need for some work done on what the, um, the interaction between the different parts of the Scottish budget, because it, the introduction of welfare payments changes the, the again, changes the, the landscape quite massively, and how Scotland deals with that is extremely important. Okay. I've got five people want to make supplementaries here, so to try and rattle through this if we can. Alex. A small point that was mentioned there, and I wanted to go back over it just so that I understand it. Uh, Philip Mulburn made the suggestion that Scottish borrowing should have to be serviced exclusively from Scottish tax revenue rather than global income, including block grant. Uh, is that the, the general view, and is that a strict rule that we ought to apply? Sorry, I've maybe misrepresented there. It was almost... It would just the markets would need clarity whether it's serviced by pure Scottish taxes, um, obviously, which the mix is changing, or the taxes including the the money that's raised in Scotland goes to Westminster and comes back again. Um, mm. My assumption, and I think this is a reasonably safe assumption, is that the debt would be raised on the whole rather than on a split part of it, because by definition, um, the larger pool of tax raising powers you have claim over the less risky it is. Um, it's just a, it's almost a, a definitional aspect of how independent you want this debt to seem. Mm -hmm. um, and provided, and this is close to David's point about will it be fully consolidated into the UK, if the answer is probably yes, then you might as well go for cheaper debt that is reliant on the whole tax base. If it's going to be non-consolidated or potentially non-consolidated, then you go for the Scottish tax only. My personal opinion, I'm, legally, given what I do for a living, I'm not allowed to give investment advice. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion is go cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not in private, so I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but you, you don't see uh, the size of Scottish tax revenue limiting the ability of Scotland to use its borrowing powers? Correct. Other than in the most practical sense, we can only yeah, borrow what we can afford. Yeah, other than in yes. <laughs> yeah. Jump in. Income tax is, is going to generate about 11 billion a year, the whole mm -hmm. of income tax, and you've got half of VAT, another five mm -hmm. or so billion. We're talking about the Scotland Act giving us 2.2 potential, 2.2 billion potentially, to spend on infrastructure. Well, the servicing costs on that go nowhere near the kind of revenue you're raising mm -hmm. from income tax in Scotland and, uh, and VAT together. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think in the first instance it would be much of an issue. Mm -hmm. I can maybe say you're right. I mean, the key word there is affordability, in effect. I mean, the, the likelihood is that there'd be an expectation that there'd be a consideration of risk across all the, the basket of taxes, but uh, the, the consideration for policy implementation would be what is affordable and is this sustainable over um, generations. Thank you. OK, Linda, and then Lewis. Yes, yeah, it's just some clarification back to the start of the discussion that I'm looking for. It was quite clear um, you know, from the, the Smith report um, about borrowing powers looking for um, a prudential borrowing regime. And there was a lot of discussion around that on the Commission about how it was felt that that would be a sensible way forward. Um, a recognition that local authorities actually had more power in terms of borrowing than the Scottish Parliament government currently had. And then wh when I'm looking at, um, at Dawn Sipfa's paper in the executive summary 1.2, 
it's um, talking about a potential omission um, from the enduring settlement document in terms of what was in the Smith report. So then, when we look at the enduring settlement document, the draft clauses, under the section of borrowing for capital spending, the first clause um, does recognise what the Smith Commission agreement requested, but then it goes on to say the 2012 Act already provides the Scottish Parliament with specific powers as set out above. I find that quite confusing because it's quite clear to me that we don't have a prudential borrowing regime. That was what was requested. And then we have draft clauses which say, well, you already have that power. So c can I have views on that? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it uh, relates back to what I said in um, my opening comments, that um, the, the discussion and the recommendation from the Smith Commission was for introduction of a, a prudential framework. And their expectation was that that would have translated through to the, the, the clauses. And it's not there. Um, despite that, there is still in the command paper discussion as if there is actually going to be uh, a prudential framework. But the, uh, the trigger point, which we think is primary legislation, or the proposal for primary legislation, is, is not there. So at the moment, we can talk about prudential framework. We do not have one. We do not have the basis to, to enable one to, to be introduced. The statutory borrowing power that uh, Scotland has at the moment is the, uh, the 2.2 billion, which is, is capped. And again, it's maybe worth comparing that to the uh, experience of local authorities a number of years ago, where in effect there was a cap which was actually prescribed by, by central government um, that was actually removed in the introduction of a more flexible framework which enabled public bodies, local authorities, to actually have regard to affordability, sustainability and prudence, but uh, to borrow at a level which was more akin to local need rather than central prescription. And you can see how that similarity was expected to be overlaid here. So, again, I would reiterate, for as much as we're talking about borrowing powers, we do not have, we do not have the infrastructure then set out to enable us to have a meaningful discussion about borrowing powers. There is no proposal for borrowing powers at the moment, is, is what I see. So we're there for um, no further forward than we were. Um, totally. We still we would still be have to adhere to the 2.2 billion plus the, the extra 10 10 percent. There's an interesting reference in the, uh, the the command paper, which actually talks about the prudential framework, and it does say um, that it was not um, aimed at increasing the amount of capital expenditure, um, which is an interesting indication. That, and that may well be the case, but it was aimed at introducing flexibility, and it is that flexibility that, um, as a country, um, Scotland would be looking for. So we would be able to administer rather than have powers to change? Yes, restricted, as it stands to the 2.2 billion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lewis? Yeah, really along the same lines, to understand better the uh, experience of the prudential framework uh, as it's worked, because clearly it's, it's a code in which statute requires uh, local authorities to have regard. Which, which can have a weaker meaning in Scots practice than it does in England, as I understand it. But, but so, 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 so partly to understand how far that's been successful in delivering what was intended. And also, I, I, I think for Philip Milburn, he used the phrase that the market will look for the strongest possible legislation, the strongest possible framework. From a market perspective, the difference between the borrowing provision in the 2012 Act and the prudential framework, is that significant uh, or not from a market perspective? So two, two, two supplementaries for me on related aspects. OK, if we can talk about the, the, the practical operation. Um, there was a fairly seamless move from the, what was, uh, those of us who are familiar with local authority to call the, the Section 94 regime into the prudential code. Um, and the practical operation of it moved from um, how government centrally would actually specify to each individual local authority how much um, they would be allowed to borrow, which in effect was a, was a well, they were prescribed a level for capital expenditure, was, which was a proxy for, for borrowing, and local authorities would borrow up to and including that, uh, that level. Um, on the 1st of April 2004, and that changed with the introduction of the, the prudential framework. Um, and from that central prescription, we went to this local flexibility. And that local flexibility was placed firmly on the shoulders of not only the chief financial officers, but the local politicians themselves. So rather than actually being told 
um, specifically what they could actually afford to spend on capital. Um, the responsibility was theirs, uh, which had regard to their strategic planning and their local needs. And it was seen as a framework which was not only more flexible, but more in keeping with uh, a more strategic approach to how local services should actually be delivered. The, the control mechanism uh, was twofold, was the, the regulations um, underlying the primary legislation and secondly the, the professional practice which was the, the professional code itself, um, which was a prescribed code for the, the professionals within local authorities, um, which requires the chief financial officer to report regularly to elected members to place responsibility for the first time, I've got to say, on, on elected members to actually be aware of, have regard to and approve the, the capital plans going forward, which was something which, as I said, was um, something more akin to central uh, prescription. Um, on the 11 years since the, the introduction, um, I'm not aware of any um, uh, approval, uh, sorry, um, um, qualification to the, the financial accounts of the local authorities. Um, I know that Audit Scotland are in the process of finalising a report. There's probably going to be a report comes out next year, uh, next month, um, about um, the, uh, the borrowing and treasury management in local authorities. Uh, but uh, my sense is, from the, the information that I'm aware of, um, not only in Scotland but throughout the, the UK, where the potential code is in operation, as, is that it has been successful and it has actually operated um, as expected, and it's, it's allowed that local flexibility and freedom to be uh, utilised fully by local authorities. And, and without, without oversimplifying, would it be fair to describe the 2012 Act provision as, as parallel to the Section 94 Correct. provision? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a fair yeah, comparison. Yeah. 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 Just, I mean, just, I mean, that may be true. Uh, they're not all borrowing at AAA. They're not all AAA, um, uh, so they are borrowing a little bit more expensively than central government. Is it's not AAA anymore, but it's nearly AAA. Well, if I don't you want to. Nothing to okay. add. Thank you, <coughs> Duncan, and then Stuart. Then. Sorry, from oh, sorry, I apologize. Sorry, I did, I did just specifically want Philip's view as to whether there was a, a difference in the and from a market perspective between a prudential borrowing regime and one which is capped and, and directed from the centre. It would be nuanced enough that it would be considered, but it would be way down the list of priorities, so that it, um, I imagine most people would gloss over that compared to other issues. Right. Duncan, then, and then Stuart. In an attempt to simplify, even for me, because all, all of this stuff is, is, is pretty difficult for me, but, uh, but I'm going back to a recurring theme uh, that I've raised at, um, at previous committees, when we've been dealing with each of the issues that come out of Smith and the difficult issues, but are, are we at this? You know, you know reading the the, the, the the papers and the evidence, are we at the stage where what we need to have is is those understandings taken into account the UK influence and in that's the European influence in this, that before we get to any of the other issues about the level of borrowing, we need the institution, the framework in place. And if we get the framework in place that it deals with risk link, <coughs> linked to the level of borrowing and uh, security of the markets and indeed uh, the financial institutions and that framework in place, then does it, is there then the potential, agreeing that principle within that framework, then the, the the, the issues of a level of borrowing, borrowing how, we, how, we, how we service that day, how we issue bonds, and for goodness sake, all of, all of that. Is it, is it chicken and egg here? Does, do we need to settle these issues? Although you have expressed little interest in the institutional frameworks in your paper, eh, eh, Professor Bell, that, 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 is that not the, the key to this, that the foundation to this, and everything else flows if we get some of those things right? I, I mean, I, the simple argument is that if that framework is not in place, the markets will take it out on you. If there is, if there is uh, uncertainty associated with how, um, for example, things like the block grant adjustment are going to work, which is hugely important for, for Scotland, how the welfare uh, monies are going to be transferred, whether there's going to be any you know, short run uh, adjustments to uh, grants for uh, political reasons, which may be going on in Northern Ireland at the moment. Um, you know, 
until the markets see a clear framework, it seems to me that everyone will be paying a little bit more for the debt than, uh, than they need. need. Uh, I suppose uh, the uh, other follow uh, uh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, just, uh, just to add, I, I mean, and I think you've got to go beyond the, the prudential regime here because we're now talking about the macroeconomics of, uh, of uh, Scotland and the UK as a whole because borrowing positions taken by local authorities don't matter hugely, uh, but, uh, you know, the position of the country as a whole does matter for borrowing purposes for all kinds of things you know that we're in this austerity regime largely because we've uh, our, our borrowing got out of control towards the end of the last decade so that of course is true but again i think it's worth um, bearing in mind that um, the, the national borrowing limit stands at 2.2 billion pounds whereas for local government at the moment the outstanding uh, debt is, is 15 billion in effect so local authority uh, you can actually come to the conclusion of um, considerably greater powers even now than the, the national uh, government in effect but i also think um, again it's worth reiterating and i couldn't agree more with uh, duncan mcneil's point is that we do need in our view the framework we have to know what it is we're actually speaking about otherwise I think we then revert to, to type, dare I say, at the three of us, we start talking about the, the, the concerns, the issues, the risks and the problems associated with it. And we've got to come back to why this is actually a good thing, that the point of the borrowing powers is to enable you as politicians to have the full suite of fiscal available powers that you need to actually deliver positive policies to benefit the people of Scotland. That, that's what it's about. It's not a technical issue, in effect. It shouldn't be a technical issue. We can handle that. You have to have, however, uh, the tools to enable you to, to do your job and to make your decisions. I say thank you, Don. I think Don's sort of got to the heart of the matter here of my assumption is the framework will be put in place at some stage if there is the political desire and will to do so. Um, it's maybe a bit of a bold assumption, but then the question is, once that framework's put in place, um, A, does it want to be used? That's, is a, well, there's not much point putting it in place if you don't want to use it. And then B, what cost um, in terms of the interest cost and the, the intergenerational cost that Don was talking about earlier? Just very, very briefly, I mentioned the, the, the European uh, agreements that were involved in and the UK sort of relationship that needs to exist to either secure some of that money or whatever. Um, is, is there an issue in terms of the whole of Scotland's debt that we need to have some discussions with local authority and that central government are not going to be using up all that borrowing and as a consequence there is less borrowing for local authorities? I I'm happy to say that. My understanding of the, the way the debate has gone is that uh, the, the powers that have been discussed um, or, or the the, the flexibilities that have been discussed, um, the intention is to, to enhance rather than limit or to, to penalise any existing powers. I, I wouldn't an, uh, anticipate that. I mean, I think Professor Bell says we can go double that cap if you get the frameworks right. So the, 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 the cap, as I describe it, is low. So that needs to grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, one issue is if you're you thinking about all Scotland's debt, to what, to what proportion of the PFI debt? Uh, should be brought on to the balance sheet because that, you know, that, was a, that has been a very contentious issue for the UK as a whole over, mm -hmm. o o over the years. And, and as I say, there's about a billion going out each year just to service uh, uh, that debt. Um, the, yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, it, there is a good argument for having a kind of total view about the indebtedness of, of, uh, of all of the public bodies in Scotland, because again, you know, what if something goes wrong? Who will bear the cost of that? Suppose that one of our local authorities uh, failed to abide by the um, um, uh, prudential regime and got into trouble, who would uh, uh, bear the cost of that? Would it, would it be the Scottish government? Um, one might expect that that would be the case, but. Who knows? I, well, at least I don't know uh, what, the, what the answer to that uh, uh, question is. And I, I think, you know, to assume that things will always work out is quite a strong assumption over time. Before I come to Stuart, let's just finish this bit off because the, 
there's, there's something that's not barking here, and that's the actual what's the limit we're going to have or not. And the, the command, the, the Scotland Act talks about two billion. The previous Scotland Act committee, I think, sensibly came to a conclusion that it should be five billion, if I'm correct. And do you? The, the, the three of you support that idea that it should be closer to five billion um, uh, in, in that respect, and why should that be? I, I'd just like to get some of that on the record so that we come back to where we were. I mean, could I? I, I mean, if the um, if there's a continuation of the capital grant element as part of the you know the the spending review, uh, uh, we'll allocate Dell for the next two years, three years ahead, and it is normally uh, you know, a resource component and a capital component, and you can reduce, you can transfer from resource into capital, um, but you can't transfer yeah. in the opposite direction. Uh, so, you know, the borrowing power would be, uh, you know, it seems to me conditional on how much money you're getting from that source. Uh, through the through the block grant, and arguably, you know, too little has been spent on infrastructure for uh, in 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 recent uh, years. And there's a sort of multiplier argument that um, money spent on on infrastructure does have a more long run beneficial effect on growth. Um, so. You need. <laughs> unfortunately, I don't think I can give you an answer about how much until I knew how much capital is coming through Dell. And I also, you know, um, Don and Philip mentioned the question about uh, intergenerational burden. We have to be very confident that we're in a position to make decisions that our uh, grandchildren are going to say, well, that was the right decision to make. We've got ourselves in this much debt, but we have these assets, the fourth road bridge or whatever, that offset these, and, and these are the, you know, the things that the last generation did for us. Okay. Don, yeah, thought. can I comment on that? Um, yeah. I think that um, the, the answer, in effect, is, is what will you as politicians actually want to do? What are your priorities? Um, how do you want to actually deliver it? And if it's an investment in infrastructure, then that might necessitate an increase from somewhere around 2.2 to a figure, say, closer than, than, than 5 billion. But it's going to ultimately be about what is affordable and what is sustainable. I think to actually talk about fixed numbers, I think maybe just takes us into the realm of almost like a credit card limit in effect, um, whereas what we're actually looking at, I would say, is a system whereby there is flexibility um, for um, the Scottish Government to enable to take decisions depending on economic circumstances, depending on what the, the policies it actually wants to implement. So, as I say, that um, what it actually has to hand is a, a suite of, of fiscal tools to enable it to take all the necessary decisions um, in effect. And I know that's maybe unsatisfactory and that I'm not giving you a specific well, figure, but I think it, it's, it's a flexibility that we're actually looking at, and whether it's 2.2 billion or whether it's 5 billion or, or greater um, is irrelevant compared to what it is you will actually want to do on a, on a national basis. Okay. Um, again, just to add to that, and sorry, I, I alluded to this earlier, talking about ad valorem. I, again, I would try to avoid a hard limit, be it 2.2 or 5 billion, yeah, I and I would veer toward some form of percentage of GDP, yeah. of Scottish GDP. Um, that would obviously is need negotiating, uh, but so that it can either put in place a counter-cyclical measure, and if you assume there's a downturn and recession, GDP shrinks by 2 to 3 per cent, then that starts to be a sensible sort of area. And then the second question is exactly what Don said, the serviceability of that extra debt or the service cost of it, and what effect that has on the future years after that as well. But I would always try to look at a percentage to make sure this could last for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, assuming the Scottish economy, as everyone does, which should grow nicely over that period. That seems to be a progressive and sensible way to go about it, but yeah. of course Treasury might not see it that way because they want to put limits on it, and that's why they want to have a discussion about it. But Stuart? Uh, well, the question I was going to ask has partly been answered now uh, after the last uh, couple of minutes, but, but there's uh, another element to it, though. It's uh, the word certainty uh, and also the other word of uncertainty has been mentioned. Uh, this morning. So, if uh, in terms of the 2.2 billion limit, um, then uh, it could be argued that that then provides an element of certainty in terms of what a government could do 
but whereas if, it, if uh, Mr. Milburn, you suggested in terms of the, the percentage of GDP, uh, if, you ha if you had that and there was an, uh, an economic downturn at some point in the future, that could then uh, uh, be argued that uh, that provides an element of uncertainty in terms of what borrowing could actually happen for a government. Is that, am I correct? No, I, I completely that? agree. You were right. This, the, the absolute cap of, say, 2.2 billion provides certainty. And please don't take this as flippant in any way whatsoever, but 2.2 billion, <coughs> excuse me, is such a small amount of money in the international market sense uh, that it would also be implicitly assumed that if the Scottish Government did get into borrowing difficulties, that it would be so small that there would be um, some form of bailout from the rest of the UK Government. Um, but that would be implicit, not explicit, um, assumed by the market. Uh, and the, certainly and another element to this as well, though, uh, also, I mean, economies are cyclical. Uh, and um, in a hypothetical situation, uh, if, it, if the 2.2 billion limit was there over the course of the last, uh, say the last uh, seven years, uh, and at some point in the future, um, if the 2.2 billion was there, then the, the government would have had uh, that element of, uh, of certainty and flexibility to, to then invest. But if you did have the GDP, or well, percentage of GDP uh, figure, uh, and also the economy had, uh, went down, then that would, uh, it could be argued that should maybe actually decrease the government's opportunity to actually help stimulate the economy, particularly if it was going to be in infrastructure investment. Would that, am I um, accurate in that? Do you mind if I go first on that one? It's, uh, this isn't any comment on the Scottish Government whatsoever. Governments around the world often talk about balanced budgets and have the debt to GDP and fiscal deficit ratios, such as the Maastricht 3% fiscal deficit, 6% debt to GDP. What governments around the world always forget to do is pay back the debt in the good times. So they find themselves banging up against the limits exactly at the time when they should be spending. So the limit would almost be there to would be to, as exactly as you say, that you exactly want to spend when you can't, but the idea should hopefully be some form of prudence that you do pay it back um, in the good times. Uh, so that's, that's the hardest bit, is it's good fun spending money um, and building infrastructure. It's a popular thing to do. Paying it back is the hard bit. So I would argue that the GDP limits are sensible, provided there is some form of framework um, or agreement to make sure budgets are balanced through the cycle. Um, so that you have the flex to use that firepower in the downturn. Yeah, I mean, you might want to, to uh, not have it as a, uh, as a share of uh, uh, current GDP, but of cyclically adjusted GDP, so you, you, you take the cyclical effects out of it. Of course, that opens up a whole bunch of arguments which actually were played through in the last decade as to what exactly the cyclically adjusted level of GDP was. Uh, but that, you know, uh, that, that's certainly uh, um, an issue. And I, I think one thing that we've glossed over in, in the last few minutes is, is the issue of um, the uh, borrowing powers for uh, under the Scotland Act 2012. The 2.2 the 2 is for infrastructure. It's not actually mentioned that it's for uh, combating the effects of recession. Um, there is a provision for... Um, resource spending, which is really about um, where you get it wrong as far as the forecasts of your tax revenues are concerned. And that's, in my paper, what I tried to do was to say, well, what, what would be the worst case scenario for, for getting it wrong? Because that, that would create an immediate problem, um, as it did in the UK in 2009-10, when income tax revenues went way below what had been forecast uh, for them. And, and so you've got, you've got a, a sort of piggy bank to deal with that issue, as well as the kind of longer term capital infrastructure issue. And, and I think, you know, the, the way that uh, the uh, enduring settlement document goes, it tries to make that distinction fairly clear. I think Lewis has got a short supplementary. Just very quickly to pick up on David Bell's earlier point about what would happen if a local authority borrowed irresponsibly and the assumption is made that the Scottish Government or the UK Government would bail it out. Is, is the implication of that comment that there needs to be some statutory backup to that? And do you think the same would apply in relation to UK Governments 
bailing out a Scottish government which got it financially wrong and, and found itself in that Well, kind of I mean, one view you could take is, like the Scottish government borrow as much as it likes, as long as there is no... Uh, it, it is absolutely clear that the UK government will not bear it, bail it out if, if, it, if it gets into difficulties. And, you know, countries find that incredibly difficult to do, to stick with a no-bailout clause. We've seen that play this week with Greece. It, you know, it, they thought there was a no-bailout clause. The Germans were very strong on the issue, but ultimately another compromise has been found. So it is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. And that's presumably because as long as Scotland is part of the UK, part of the UK public sector borrowing profile, then it's in the UK's interest always to bail out. Well, because, well, it, it, you know, there's this too big to fail argument, and whether Scotland is too big or not, doesn't matter. It's not in the UK's interest for, for Scotland to get into fiscal difficulties. That, that's absolutely clear. So, you know, that does maybe affect the market thinking about, about debt. Don? Yeah, just to, to pick up um, on the, the point being made about uh, local authorities um, and the, uh, the possibilities um, which, which could uh, transpire. Um, under the, the 2003 legislation, um, there is actually a reserve power for the Scottish Government, which means it can actually revert to, to central control, in effect. So it may well be that uh, the, the primary legislation that comes along may have um, some sort of protective clause like, like that. Okay. Mark, I was going to come to you, but just to keep political balance, I'm going to go to Alison Johnson first, and I'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, I think I'd probably just like to pick up on Lewis MacDonald's question there. Um, you suggest in your paper that bailouts are actually more likely where the central and sub-national governments perhaps share the same political persuasion. I is there international evidence that backs that up? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to share the paper that I was... Um, drawing that uh, uh, evidence from. There doesn't, I mean, there seems to be no uh, regularity around the um, kind of fiscal arrangements that exist between uh, different, uh, between national governments and sub-national governments. You, the, the, the researchers who looked into this didn't find that, you know, it was a particular form of federal system that resulted in the need for bailouts. It, that doesn't seem to be it, but they did find that it was, quite, it was more common um, that uh, where the sub-national government and the central government shared the same political allegiance, bailout, bailout was more likely. It wasn't actually the too big to fail argument. It was, are you in the same party argument? But obviously, bailouts do occur in cases where they don't share the same political. They do, and I, I mean, I, I was quite surprised at the countries uh, that I listed. I think it was Sweden, Germany, Australia were, were three of those, and you would assume that these are countries that are fiscally responsible. Okay, I think I would appreciate seeing that yeah. that paper certainly. Um, okay. I'd like to go back to to Linda Fabiani's line of questioning. It's just about the the lack of a clause, <laughs> if you like, um, because Professor Bell, you, you state that borrowing powers are an essential part of any fiscal framework, but um, Don Peebles, you suggest that the, the draft clauses don't provide for an extension to the existing powers. Are you surprised? Do you think this has just been an, an oversight? Is it a surprising oversight? The assumption I'm making is it's, uh, it's either an omission or it's um, uh, a key consideration by the the draft person of the command paper that uh, they're looking for some other form of arrangement. They do talk the language of, of prudential framework in there, and you could be forgiven for thinking that uh, a prudential framework of some form on the hands of borrowing powers has come along, but there is, there is no substance, there, there is nothing that would, would point us in, in that direction. So on the, in the absence of anything else, I, I am assuming omission at this stage. Yeah. Okay. Do you think it's unclear as to the intention? Un unclear. Um, I thought that the, the Smith Commission was, was clear. I thought that the command paper picked that up, um, but there isn't the obvious corollary in the, the command paper, which would, I thought would have been, um, given the direction of everything else, that would be a, a clear clause saying what, uh, what would actually happen. Yep. I, I agree with Don, but I wonder if it was just a victim of the, of the hurried nature of, uh, of the drafting. 
that that agreement couldn't be reached in, in the time available. Okay. Do you have a view, Mr Milburn? Um, I will stick with it to the experts, if that's okay. Okay, that's fine, Convener. Thanks. Thank you. Mark. Thank you, Convener. I think <clears throat> Alison Johnson's questioning leads nicely on. Um, Obviously, at the moment, there is a capital grant provided to the to the Scottish Government. Um, I think the expectation had been that the uh, addition that there would be additional borrowing powers as a supplement to that. However, there has been some suggestion that it may be a replacement, uh, which obviously would provide for restricted flexibility in terms of capital investment. What, what, what would be your understanding of, of, of where this is likely to go in terms of the, the capital grant uh, uh, that currently is provided to the Scottish Government? Um, I, I think the wording of the um, uh, Enduring Settlement uh, uh, document wasn't entirely clear on this point. Um, so this is what has happened to local authorities, as, as Don has been explaining. Um, the, I guess the big question would be, um, you know, what happens to the block grant if, if, if there's a decision around, uh, you know, a change in the status of the Dell Capital element of, the, of that block grant? Does the block grant stay the same and Scotland get to decide on the allocation. You see, that allocation is always set up in the spending review. The, the allocation between resource and capital <clears throat> is set up in the spending review by the Treasury. Each department gets uh, a, a resource allocation and a capital allocation, uh, and, and it cannot reduce the capital allocation. Now, what it, I mean, it is another bit of uncertainty, I'm afraid, but um, not only are we not absolutely clear about whether um, Scotland might go just towards a prudential regime approach, but we're not absolutely clear what that might mean in relation to the Dell size of the Dell grant? Because to take away the, you know, the 2.3 billion or so mm. would be pretty drastic. So, so for example, it may be uh, in, in your consideration that that 2.3 billion would become uh, part of a, 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 a lump sum resource allocation, and it would then be open to a future Scottish government to make a, an allocation from resource to capital. Uh, I mean, they can obviously that, that, they can obviously make resource to capital allocations yeah. at present, but yeah. there is a capital Dell yeah. identified. Yeah. Are you suggesting that identification may go, and it would be for the government to decide its own capital allocation from within a resource budget, or, 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 or the, are you I mean, suggesting that, something different? That, that's a possible outcome, uh, you know, and I'm just speculating mm -hmm. around this. Um, in in a world if where uh, um, you know, depending on what happens in relation to the political outcomes in May and then the spending review outcomes following that, um, it might be that, uh, you know, further cuts are being made and the Treasury decides to allow departments themselves to determine Dell and resource uh, uh, limits. But that you know, that is just speculation sure. on my part. Uh, I'd be grateful for perhaps Mr Peebles and Mr Milburn's input on this. I mean, it does concern me that there appears to be a lack of clarity uh, in respect of this. I mean, uh, obviously in terms of future planning uh, and obviously from this committee's perspective in terms of determining whether what is, what is going to come to Scotland is first of all, matching up to what was what was agreed in the Smith Commission, but also uh, in terms of its appropriateness for use. Um, do you do you agree that there needs to be some further clarity around what happens to the capital grant allocation as it currently stands? I think against the background of the, the whole um, consideration of, of borrowing and um, capital expenditure, there has to be clarity. Um, I think we have to be clear as to, to why um, we would actually want that in effect. And again, I come back to the, to the point that it's, it's a positive thing and we don't want necessarily to get caught up in the technicalities of the, uh, the HM Treasury-led uh, um, terminology and like we can do that. What, what is it we're actually looking for? Uh, you're actually looking for the fiscal tools to enable you to, to deliver effective government in effect. Um, and what that might mean is that um, 
depending on the, the state of the economy, depending on what the policies of the day actually are, it may well be that in certain uh, years yeah, you borrow more than you would previously, or it may well be that there's, there's a shift from, um, from one resource to, to the other. And that's the kind of freedom that, that you're actually looking for. But it's going to be wholly dependent on what, as politicians, you decide that you want to do, um, rather than what another department decides that you actually should be, be doing. And I'll come back to uh, the point about uh, on the comparison with uh, the, the section, the, uh, section 94 and um, uh, prudential framework arrangement in local authorities. That was the whole point that it shifted central prescription with clarity um, from government to the local um, arrangement in, in Scottish local authority. And I would see a similarity that that could, could uh, undertake uh, the same in, from central government to, to the Scottish government. Um, again, I'd add or oh, reiterate it's part of the big unknown at the moment um, for a couple of years' time is the size of the block grant um, in terms of um, obviously a lot of the taxing ability is already known. The big unknown is then what the compensatory decrease in the block grant is. And that's the, the bit that obviously needs, uh, forgive the terminology, but nailing down first before you then even know if you need to borrow or want to borrow. But I completely echo the comments from earlier that um, even then, once you've got your steady state, how much you have roughly each year to spend, then having that flex around it is a necessary power in order to be able to have local tools, um, local at the Scottish level tools, in order to do counter-cyclical or infrastructure type investment. So my personal view is, as well as the ongoing, this is how much you know you have to spend year on year, having that capital extra power in order to be able to do big projects, implement big projects if one so desires, is a necessary tool um, for, to have that more flexibility that is desired. So I think the, I think the, the concern would be, um, if it were to go the other way from what Professor Bell has suggested might happen, is that if that £2.3 were to be removed and essentially had to be replaced through borrowing, it means that you're borrowing £2.3 just to stand still before you can then exercise further borrowing power. Yeah, it is actually worse than that, um, in that you're borrowing to stand still, and then the interest on that will start to compound. Okay. It's, it's even, it is that bad. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. I've got a couple of quick supplementaries in this area, and I want to just get into a couple of other areas before we get to the end of the session. Uh, I think Linda had a supplementary, and I think Alec as yeah, well. Yeah, I do, and I, th I think my supplementary might be a very confusing one. It was just a... <laughs> it was just when, when Mark w was talking there, something struck me about if you only have the admin power and not further fiscal power, and you're relying on flexibility within that admin power, how does that then affect things like the Treasury rules on end-year flexibilities that were changed a few years ago, clawback? Would you have to set up particular types of borrowing that was purely drawdown? Would that be taken into account um, in these annual calculations that are carried on? Paper, David. Yeah, I, yeah, David was talking about the changes to end-year flexibility in his paper. I mean, the, uh, those changes took place uh, because the Scottish Government um, uh, managed to successfully argue that you know, Scotland was actually building up a considerable underspend on its Dell budget and that there was a clear case that that uh, should be spent, in, uh, and, it, and it was, in, in, in subsequent years. Um, there is, uh, you know, this, this is part of, of, of seeking clarity around all of this, because, as I point out in the paper, you've got, on the one hand, forecast errors around the taxes that you may generate, and, you know, if we make the kind of errors that were made in 2009 that, that, and commit to spending on that basis, then there is an immediate need to borrow on that behalf, on that, uh, uh, for that reason. And then on the other hand, I don't think people have mentioned, kind of noted this uh, in, in terms of, uh, of the current debate. You've also got spending risk in that you may not spend in a year what the plans say you're going to spend. So you've got the forecast error or the forecast risk, you've got the spending risk, and you need a short-term facility to deal with that. And the assumption would be that you would, in a, well, 
This would be, have to be determined by the framework that we're all talking about, but doesn't exist, and we're not really sure what it really means. But you would think that that would have to be dealt with. You know, errors of that kind, of a short-term nature, would have to be dealt with in two or three years, whereas the borrowing for capital reasons would be longer-term borrowing, uh, which might go to the uh, which might go to the market. So. Uh, you know, there, I, I, all that I'm doing is adding to the uncertainty. Uh, sorry about that, but um, uh, it, I think it reveals further the need for a clear framework that that we've all been talking about. That that all of these issues together can be uh, uh, discussed, and I suspect you know it has to be done at the UK level because it's not only Scotland that's in this game. Uh, it may well be Wales if they get the income tax power and Northern Ireland if they get the corporation tax power. Thank you. One John. Provide, I think is a very important factor is the clawback at the end of the year for the underspend. In any future regime, um, I think it would be prudent to not have that clawback as such because you want to be able to hang on to that money for future years so that one could almost target to have an underspend each year because solving an underspend is much easier than solving an overspend. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Go on. Yeah, I think the point I was going to make is the reason we're using terms like end-year flexibility and clawback is because Scotland doesn't have the power to hold reserves as such. Um, and it's part of the, the HMT um, um, overall look on an annual basis rather than on a long-term basis. And one of the recommendations that we actually made to the Smith Commission is that, again, part of a significant fiscal suite would be the power to actually hold reserves. And there's reference to reserves, short, a small reserve in the, the command paper, but not the full power that we would have been looking for or we think is necessary. OK. Alex? Yes, I think we've got into the area I was going to go in. It's great fun to... Uh, uh, have capital borrowing powers because you can spend money on stuff and put it on tech. But good housekeeping requires that we address the revenue issue. And as you mentioned there, there's no power to hold the reserve. So what proportion of Scotland's borrowing powers are going to be, uh, borrowing uh, ability is going to have to be held in reserve in order to ensure that we can overcome any tax uh, volatility year on year? You're right to refer to the um, volatility because as as um uh, the, the income base increases um, by way of power. Um, volatility will be more of a consideration, um, mm -hmm. and that will be had to be factored into um, any calculations of affordability and long-term um, sustainability. Um, so the, the government, looking ahead, will have regard to that and will be considering the extent to which all of the revenue resources have to be utilised in a single year or the extent to which, looking ahead to what it thinks may happen economically in the future, it has to set some of those revenue resources aside to actually build up a reserve such that it can actually draw down from that, uh, that reserve in the future. Um, th there is no statutory requirement, nor is there any specific guided requirement about percentage of, of reserves which um, should, should be held. And again, that's down to local determination and consideration of what the economic circumstances and known information is at, at the time. Would it be fair to say that the risk of tax volatility is actually relatively low uh, in, within the proposals compared to what it might have been, for example, if um, oil and gas revenue had been devolved, the volatility would have been so big that the borrowing powers required to cover that year on year would have been uh, disproportional and virtually unachievable? I've got no evidence to give on, on that specific question, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Pure, on pure economics, no political point at all, yes is the answer. Um, of the, of if oil, oil revenue was devolved, of course it would add to volatility. Good volatility in the up years, bad volatility in the down years, but yes. Um, the rough numbers, I don't have them in front of me, sorry, but under currently what has been devolved um, under the command paper, Scotland will become, the tax state will become more geared to economic growth, just Scottish economic growth than it was before. And it will go up from the, roughly the high single digits pence in the pound to mid-teens pence in the pound in terms of um, for every extra 1% Scotland grows, how much extra Scotland has spending power because of Scottish growth rather than UK growth. Uh, and if, if, if oil was included, then that would have added enormous volatility. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just so, I mean, to add, the... I tried in my paper to work out a kind of worst-case scenario for income tax volatility, and that's based on 
the error that was made in the budget forecast, I think for uh, eight, nine or nine, 10, and what actually happened in terms of income tax revenue. And if you translated that across to uh, the Scottish income tax take, if, if Scotland gets all of the income tax take, that would be, you know, that would be cost, costing in the high 400 million, that, that, kind of, that kind of area. And I suppose that probably was the worst post-war shock to income tax revenues that, that, uh, that has been experienced. Okay. Uh, Alec, you okay? <coughs> I guess, though, that somebody had said about making sure you do the investment at the right place in the good years. If we do it, if we'd manage things properly, or can manage things properly, then that starts to manage out the volatility issue if you've got the uh, sufficient reserves in the system to be able to deal with that through the, from the good years. Anyway, the question I wanted to ask Philip in particular was, in your paper you suggested two different ways of treating the expenditure in Scotland in terms of balance sheet issues. One, a balance sheet for Scotland approach, um, and the, sorry, so to Dawn, I apologise, it's not Philip, to Dawn, um, and the other one, the whole, of, the whole of Scotland accounts, I can see you starting to wonder, did I say that in my paper? <laughs> but it was Dawn, sorry. You, you suggested these two different approaches. What do you think the best approach would be? Um, I think that the, uh, the, the two things that we, uh, we um, focused on, um, well, if we come back to accountability, that's what we're actually interested in, because if we actually think about the extent to which um, that there's going to be new powers, uh, you're going to be doing different things going forward, uh, both on expenditure, both on income. Um, does that mean that the old form of accountability would be appropriate? In some cases it might be, but um, if we actually think about the, the proposals as, as a country, um, we don't necessarily report as a country. We do on statistics, but we actually don't on audit accounts. Um, we heavily favour um, a balance sheet for Scotland, which would actually form part of the whole of Scotland account so that we can actually assess uh, the performance of the of, of the country overall, the public services of the country overall, something that uh, we aren't able to do at the moment unless we actually aggregate the, the, uh, the audited financial statements of the nearly 200 public bodies that are actually there. So, yeah, so we favour whole of Scotland accounts. OK. And, Philip, can I ask you a question specifically about... I think I've got you it's right this time that I'm asking you this question. Obviously, as Scotland begins to get these powers, the knowledge and interest in the markets will begin to emerge. Do you think, and, and I'm not sure from, from, from where I sit, certainly, and I don't have enough information, to know that the markets are beginning to be informed about what Scotland's going to get. And is there a job for the Scottish and UK governments to begin to warm up the markets so when we do enter into this situation, we're able to be entering in a much easier and smoother process? Short, <coughs> excuse me, losing my voice there in shock. Um, the short answer is uh, yes, um, of keeping in touch with the markets. Again, to emphasise, the amount of debt potentially being able to raise is, uh, if it's just 2.2 billion, is very small internationally compared to, say, the 1.3 trillion of UK debt out there. Um, but again, it's that the market loves certainty. So the more, you can, more information you give the market, the better. And staying in constant contact. In terms of the nuances of if this all goes ahead and the Scottish um, issuing entity then wants to issue debt, I think the, the necessary steps there might be better for another occasion once all the other bits of the framework are in place. But a simplified version is get together a presentation pack, trot around Edinburgh, London and a few other centres and show people the finances, the balance sheet that Don's been talking about, just give people information that they can judge the strength of the institutions, um, the strength of the legal system, all of these Scotland will score very well on, by the way, it's just um, then the strength of the fiscal position, none of it is particularly Scotland specific, it's just another country, or in this case, um, subnational issuing entity that uh, will want to issue debt to the market. So um, the more information, the better, but we are, a lot of what we're talking about is arguing about an odd half a percent of cost on the debt here or there, not on the difference between 2 and 10%, but we're maybe arguing between, for 10-year debt, 
This is an estimate, nothing more. At the moment, they're arguing the difference between 25 and 3% interest cost um, in terms of what providing the market with information will do. Okay. Thank you. Um, David? I uh, add some support to what Don has just said about getting um, accounts for the whole of the public sector in Scotland. There are ca accounts for the UK as a whole called the whole of government accounts. One of the uh, things that that does is to take into account pension liabilities, uh, both uh, state and state pension and uh, public sector pensions. Actually, I'm not absolutely sure that the state pension is in there. But if you're going to... No, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, but if you're going to take a view about what is affordable uh, going forward, the, um, uh, these accounts uh, can sometimes prove quite salutary in, in terms of uh, commitments that are forthcoming that people aren't, haven't quite uh, figured out as yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a very helpful um, session this morning. Certainly, I think as a, a number of you have said, you've, all you've done is raise more questions and more concerns, but that's still important. Stu Stu I'm sorry, Stuart, I want to come to an end of this particular part of the, the discussion. But, uh, but what I would like to say to some homework, if that's OK, because, and, and if you've got time, and I realise I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing you a bit here, to use that terminology, um, but I think... We had a discussion at the beginning, and it's been touched on all the way through, about the institutional framework and how that looks, and what that looks like in budgetary terms, in rigid regulatory perspectives, um, what the new regime would be, um, who borrows, who regulates, who scrutinises, how are the markets reassured. If you, if, if you have some time, gentlemen, I think it would be useful for us to hear a bit more from you uh, in written form about any advice you could give us in that way, I think that would be helpful to us. And I think it would also be helpful in a later date to the Finance Committee. And they may, they may be asking you the same thing, so forgive, forgive me if they are. Um, but, but thank you very much for coming along to give us evidence at this time. Um, that's the, the end of the evidence session. We're now about to go into private. And I thank the panellists for their attendance. Um, and the next meeting of the committee will be on the... Thursday the 5th of March when the committee will take evidence from a range of experts regarding the draft clauses on the Crown Estate and I close this and we now move into private. <laughs>